Hi everyone, my name is Stefan Rentowitz. I'm a professor at Munich University of Applied Sciences, which is uh, the third largest university in Munich. You probably know the other two. Um, there's something special about uh, universities of applied sciences that I will talk about. Um, just quickly a background, yeah, this is already said. Um, my major topics that I'm teaching are computer architecture, computer engineering, uh, embedded systems, but mostly on, 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 the, on the two first. Um, so it's pretty much computer fundamentals that I'm teaching and um, yeah, a little bit of embedded system security as I'm from security background. Um, beyond that, some of you may probably know me as a long-term open source silicon advocate. Um, I'm director at the Free and Open Source Silicon Foundation, which is a nonprofit based in the UK, um, operating worldwide, obviously, um, advocating yeah, the, the, uh, the advances in free and open source silicon, which means actual transistors, etc., in chips. Um, in this area, I've been active probably like 10 to 12 years now. I'm a contributor and maintainer of many projects in this area. Um, so you probably saw my name here and there. Um, if you're working in this area, you're more or less getting contact with Risk Five. I will just say a few words about it shortly. Um, and I've been an active member there from pretty much the beginning when it became public. Um, today, I'm a member of the board of the Risk Five International, which is the uh, governing uh, foundation of uh, of the Risk Five ecosystem. Um, and I inherited the share of the now called Academia and Education. Previously, it was Outreach and Academia, I think, from Mary, which is also here, I think, right? I, I believe so. Um, and I'm um, continuing the work. I will say a few words about this in the end, um, also as part of my presentation. So just as a quick background for those of you who don't know about Risk Five, it's an open instruction set architecture, short ISA. Um, which probably opens another question if you don't know about risk five what is an isa um it's essentially a definition of how a processor and a software interface each other which means in both directions so on the one hand describing um the encoding of machine instructions um the availability of machine instructions the description and some things around there like how interrupts work etc um and you know a few ISAs probably uh, without talking about them specifically, especially recently um, with the move from uh, Apple with Apple Silicon from um, Intel to ARM. Um, ARM is probably, in, especially in the UK, the most prominent ISA except x86, which is um, traditionally Intel and AMD. Um, so what's RISC V? RISC V is the fifth version of RISC instruction set architectures. RISC is a concept saying reduced instruction set complexity computers, uh, which was um, originally developed also at University of California in Berkeley by Dave Patterson and by, um, by Hennessy in Stanford. Um, so the one is MIPS, the other one is RISC, uh, RISC 1, RISC 2, etc. And now we have RISC 5, which is uh, said to be the last RISC uh, architecture developed by the team. Uh, which is nowadays uh, essentially led by Chris Dazanovic. Um, and we got out of there, and nowadays it's organized as a nonprofit organization. So they developed Risk Five at UC Berkeley for about three to four years before they got public about it, and they quickly spun it out into a nonprofit organization, uh, which governs development of the open standard and governs the ecosystem around open source and proprietary processor cores based on this instruction set architecture. There's hundreds, I always forget the number uh, of members in this nonprofit, ranging from large semiconductor companies that everyone knows, um, large companies in this area that um, like big search engines, etc., down to startups um, and many members from academia and also a couple of hundreds of individuals that are part of this organization that together want to advance the risk five instruction set architecture as a common baseline and it's a lot of shared efforts and all the nice things about working in the open and open collaboration um, which they all work together um, so just as a background probably i started teaching uh, last year in march so march 2019 um, i became a professor at munich university of applied sciences and yeah so for me it was the first teaching gig after my PhD and um, 
I was thinking that's a great thing. Uh, I know everything about Risk Five. I'm deeply involved there. I am now teaching computer organization, computer architecture. So, what could be better than Risk Five, right? And um, there's obviously many opportunities for me. Yeah, so there's many open source process, of course. Yeah, I loved them all. I used many of them before in smaller and larger projects, um, professionally and as a hobbyist, um, which is always great, right? So you have everything at hand. You can start messing around with it. You can develop it. You can give it to students to play with it. Um, and beyond that, and it's even more important, probably, you have a rich software ecosystem and a very active community. So that's what you often see with many open source ISAs that have been there before. The communities are probably a little bit smaller. Um, the software ecosystem is a little bit slower. And risk five is pretty much perfect in this um, respect. Um, so from my point of view, and um, I will quickly tell you why this was not the entirely correct um, um, assessment of the situation. <laughs> that's all I need, right? And uh, what I found is some challenges, which came essentially from the fact that I'm an educated lecture engineer, um, and I'm teaching in a computer science faculty, um, which it probably depends on the university and where you are and uh, how you approach it. But in my case, it turned out that throwing FPGAs and RTL coded people is not the best choice. Um, and those are the channels that I, that I faced there. Um, so maybe as, as another background, the universities of applied sciences, they differ from um, in, in German, it's called Hochschule or uh, Fachhochschule, it was called before. It differs from universities in, um, in that they are more practically oriented. So they, we spend a lot of time on, on labs and less on the theoretical backgrounds. Um, so that's generally like how we differentiate from each other. It's, it's more industry focused and more yeah, that you have some practical skills that you bring when you get out. I think in the UK, there was something similar before, uh, polytechnic universities, I think they were called. Um, and that's one thing, like when you come from university as a PhD, it's a little bit different, right? It's not, not, not always practically oriented. And yeah, the biggest gap for me was computer science. Um, as we are so practically oriented, they are educated a lot in programming and um, on different levels that I have been programming, <laughs> uh, to keep it that way. And that turned out to be a big challenge because they have virtually no background in digital design. Um, so it's not really that nice to open an, a very log file and explain to them the the nice advantages of a scoreboard on this level, right? Um, and scoreboard is a microarchitecture improvement um, to support um, high performance processor cores. And this is part of my uh, curriculum, right? Um, so I was thinking about alternatives. Um, and this turned out to be my, my main theme for the last 18 months, probably, um, to, to solve the problem that simulators, as I use them, and hardware emulation are not really accessible and fancy to my students. Um, this is what I realized pretty early. And why I started on two projects that I just wanted to quickly talk about in my presentation now. Um, so the goal for me is, and I'm an open source guy, uh, to reuse, improve, and provide open source tooling for this purpose of teaching computer fundamentals and computer architecture in RISC V. Um, and I will just give you two examples, which are the most important things. Um, the one is, um, for the very basic course for freshmen in, in bachelor's degree, um, they're learning about computer system fundamentals. Um, and in my opinion, it's ideal for this uh, to use RISC-V because it's a very basic, straightforward and modular instruction set. So you can, um, it's pretty simple for students to understand what the 40-ish instructions are that you have to learn, how to apply them to a problem and how you can get from there to more complex programs using the modular instruction set extensions. So from my point of view, it's ideal to teach it. We have used, we've been using other architectures before, um, but we are switching entirely to risk five there. Um, plus you have this broad range of available simulators and tools, and we are playing around with them a little bit. Um, but what turned out to us essentially is that we need something um, um, for the practical education that is self-contained and easy to use. 
many of these simulators are installation based and there's some browser based. Um, each of them have their different pros and cons. Uh, Visual Studio Code itself, um, which is the platform that we use, is not per se the most open source tool in the world. Um, we're calling, currently looking into using Taya instead. Um, but generally, it's a very good platform if you're developing something like this. And what we built is a self contained extension. So you just install the extension on any Visual Studio Code instance, and you can start learning RISC V. Um, without any simulators, et cetera, because they are contained in this extension. It's based on the popular Venus simulator, also from Berkeley, um, which is um, um, a browser-based um, JavaScript simulator. And we just reuse the backend and um, uh, impl um, put it into our extension. Um, the debugging facilities, and that's a great advantage of using VS Code, they are standardized and it's easy to, to spin them up. So we integrate with the debugging facilities of VS Code. So you can just uh, press F5 and start debugging with it. Um, so that's from our point of view, one of the most important things when I'm teaching. I just tell them, just download it, just open this project and start debugging, right? Um, and our extension at least is not, not the entirety of uh, Visual Studio Code, obviously, but our extension is entirely open source. And in my, from, in my opinion, very easy to extend. And I will show you an example about uh, what I mean about is easy to extend, um, because this is one of the examples that I'm using, um, which is my my own self-designed pseudo board, uh, including two press buttons, two LEDs, and two seven-segment displays. And um, that's that's what I meant about easy to extend. It probably took me like two or three hours to integrate this um, into the simulation environment. Um, it's all like based on JavaScript, CSS, and HTML. Um, and you can just hook up to um, those environment calls, which are system calls in, um, in Risk V, and create your own uh, peripherals and devices there. And then um, students can use them. And in this example, they are asked to, I don't know, this is just a very plain example. But for example, an assignment with this one is that they have to implement a counter, like count up, count down uh, with the two buttons. And when it overflows, they should put up the LED, for example. So those, it's very simple to bring up if you want to extend it. Um, it's very simple to use from my point of view. And I think it's very practical and it gets students pretty, pretty, pretty uh, quickly up to speed. Um, I have to say we'll find out because the course will start in, in uh, 14 days from now. Um, but we are pretty confident that it um, that students will like it, and um, the accessibility, from my point of view, is pretty pretty good with this one. And um, the other thing that I wanted to quickly talk about, and this is more than from my technical in-depth um, interest by myself, um, I'm teaching computer architecture, and when I teach computer architecture, from my point of view, the most important thing is to look into the processor course, right? It's not about slides explaining to Mazuru. It's more about looking to the course, understanding the advantages and limitations of different microarchitectural uh, improvements. And again, Risk Five is ideal. <laughs> Obviously, there's also an advertisement called for Risk Five, um, um, and it's very. I think it's um, by nature like it's it's developed by the team that also um, includes Dave Patterson. Um, I think it's pretty straightforward to, to assume that it's good for teaching computer architecture. Um, it has a very clear architecture and it eases the fundamental education. So it's very simple to talk about uh, the advantages of not having um, state between instructions, which is not encoded in the ISA, for example, if you use RISC V, and then talk about the advantages of out of order processing without talking about collision codes, et cetera. Um, there's many open source processor course, which is obviously one of the biggest um, advantages. They are ranging from low end embedded cores up to high end out of order cores. Um, and yeah, as I said, for me, the most important is to see the in action. I want students to see course how they operate and don't just talk about slides, right? Um, so what, I, what I'm working on practically, and it's more a framework and not really one, one, one single tool, um, it's a framework for microarchitectural tracing, um, which means that I am exposing microarchitectural details to the students and not signals in the processor core itself. So it's not about the handshake signals, but it's about what happened between two pipeline stages there. 
Um, and this is very important from my point of view to abstract from the implementation details, but learn about the microarchitecture details. Um, we use some open source processor cores, mainly the ones that everyone knows from the sky, and transpile them using Verilator, which is a tool that compiles Verilator to C++ simulations. And um, I'm augmenting it by abstracting from signals and instead tapping into there and trace microarchitectural events. Um, and there's a tool that I wrote, which is uh, roughly based of the, for those of you who know um, Gem5, it has this out of order pipeline tool, uh, viewer tool. Um, it's a little bit like it, but it's more flexible and more extensible um, in terms of more micro details. For example, this could be a branch predictor state, updates to the branch predictor, fill state of different buffers that you have in your um, out of order pipeline, etc. Um, everything is open source. So there's one repository where essentially, which is the entry point where the cores reside and everything. And um, you can find this and also from the previous. Um, a uh, course from uh, for Division Studio Codework and everything on risk5.cs.hm.edu. Um, this is just a quick sample. So you can see on the left, there's um, the processor core and um, we are exposing not all the signals in form of a waveform, but instead we are tracing individual signals, which we know that are the handshake signals. So usually you have a handshake between two pipeline stages plus the metadata assigned with it, um, yeah, including the instruction program counter, other control signals, um, probably you understand what uh, branch predictor does in this situation, et cetera. And we just tap into there and there's some DPI, which is a C to Verilog interfacing thing where you can do some post-processing and we extract the microarchitecture information that's interesting in this context of education to us. And we put it into a trace file, which is sitting in the middle. Um, which is based on the common trace format, um, which is widely adopted in, in, in Linux and, um, and surroundings, um, which is very easy to adopt because it's self-describing um, alongside the trace file with the metadata. And then there's this pipeline viewer, which is just a Python tool running in the command line, showing you, for example, here how instructions traverse the pipeline. Um, and you can see on the left, that's the most interesting part and students really like it to, to work with it and debug with it. Um, you can see how the instructions traverse the pipeline stages, in this case, in a four stage, five stage pipeline, fetch, decode, issue, execute, and retire. Um, and you can see over time, so time is wrapping around every 10 cycles. Um, so you have to read it from left to right, um, left button to uh, from left to top to uh, right button. Um, and you can see like they're enumerated. You can see how they retire, how long they take and which instructions actually was that uh, was executed. Plus you can add more information here. Um, this is just a, an example, very basic one, um, which includes um, more, more information about things like I said, like branch predictor. That's one of the most interesting ones, for example, there's one assignment where they just get an executable from me, which I tell them it's a processor core with five stages, um, which is a branch predictor. And I tell them a little bit about a branch predictor, but they have to find out all the details like parameters, um, number of um, uh, branch history tables, et cetera. Um, so this is what I, what I did and I invite everyone to collaborate on. And um, I'm always interested to find people that work on similar things because in my opinion, it's the most important um, when teaching such things um, to put it in a format which is more accessible to students. Um, and because I've been so active and been um, uh, nagging everyone about how important it is, I uh, inherited from Mary who uh, retired as chair of this committee recently, um, I think beginning of the year. Um, I've been sharing this with five academia and education special interest group. Um, it's in some part for research co uh, collaboration, but currently uh, one of the main things we're working on is educational materials. Um, if you go to the website that I mentioned before, there's also my materials that I share. And we are currently reforming the group a little bit we, because we moved away from the outreach, which is, I think, in other, um, it's more part of the marketing now, um, uh, moving more into academia and education. Um, so there's some growth phase that we saw of academic interest. People are interested in getting ready-made courses. Um, and this is some things that we are looking into. Um, 
it's currently mainly visible to risk five members there's some public facing mailing list you should get onto that and we are working on changing that um, because it's not really a thing of risk five members i think that's something that the whole computing society is interested in um, in, uh, learning how to use risk five in education uh, next meeting is next week on thursday um, 4 p.m gmt i hope i messed up already once this week um, between gmt and summer and winter time um, i'm pretty confident this is 4 p.m gmt i just double check my mailing list um this is wrong the link sorry um i will put up in an updated version or in the youtube comments you can find the actual link um and one of the things we currently do, for example, if you go to the website, this is an older screenshot, there was a redesign, you can find education materials, and we are currently nurturing, like, moderating it more and um, approaching people that we know that are teaching and try to get, um, on the one hand, education materials used, but also ready to be reused. Um, yeah, so we are working on it, making it more easy to, to grasp what, what is behind each course and how you can use it to learn yourself or to teach to others. That was it. Thank you very much. That's my website. That's my Twitter handle. Please get in touch if you would like to learn more. Um, looking forward to your questions. I already saw there are a few in the chat. Um, maybe I will just go through it. Thank you very much. Wonderful talk. Thank you very much. So um, the first question was how many lines of code roughly has your JavaScript simulator? Very good question. Um, so the simulator I mean, itself is, um, yeah. is the Venus simulator. So I will just check in the background. <laughs> um, you can find it on GitHub. It's um, maintained by a PhD student, which is teaching assistant at, uh, at Berkeley. Um, it's written in Kotlin, actually and they generate um, Java or JavaScript out of it. Um, I would say the essential part, which is like the processing of instructions on a functional level is probably around 500 lines of code. Oh, wow. Pretty good. Order package. It doesn't have privilege mode. It doesn't have virtual memory. Um, it's, it's only user mode, I would say, which, which explains why it's so less, I think. Yeah, um, so it's probably like the, the main part is 500 lines of code um, for the majority of instructions. I think there's some things around, for example, it has uh, specialized system calls um, because you don't have an execution environment around it, right? It's just running like barely, um, but it's providing, for example, um, standard input, standard output, file access. It also has um, some malloc like um, system calls not counting them in, those are probably a thousand lines additionally, um, but this order of magnitude, I think, yeah. All right, wonderful. Um, so it's, so... It's, not, it's not about high performance, I have to say. <laughs> you will find it's not really a simulator if you want to boot Linux, right? It's really about teaching. <laughs> um, for example, if you're free running, it's actually running a loop and stepping through the code. Um, which you can believe if you're running through several levels of JavaScript abstractions can be very slow and tedious. 